All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Coach Podcast. I'm here uh, with my friend Rick Plaskett. Rick is a a West Point grad uh, and former Army officer who's turned his sword into a business plowshare. Rick blends the experiences of military leadership and planning together with world-class business practices to produce huge results. Rick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Michael. Good to be here. So let's just kind of open up. Tell us a little bit, uh, a little bit more about you, um, about your past, and about kind of what got you into um, coaching in the first place. (laughs) Boy, that's an open, uh, open open-ended start right there. (laughs) Um, I I guess let's uh, let's start off with the theme of I'm a slow learner. Okay. Yeah. I I I went to West Point, graduated, uh, served in the Army for 14 years, and the slow learner came from the fact that. uh, I jumped out of an airplane in mid-flight with a parachute, uh-huh. and then the slow learner came. Um, I did it many, many, many more times, <laughs> um, and it wasn't until I left the military and was in corporate America that uh, I found that you know landing in a plane and disembarking that way was kind of comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, easier on the knees, right? It, it's a lot easier on the knees, the back, the head. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the lessons that I learned both at West Point and the lessons that I applied uh, in those 14 years, um, you know, you change the terminology around and they are absolutely applicable in business. And uh, if never more than right now in an uncertain economy, uncertain future. And when I say uncertain, there's so many moving parts that uh, just the way that we were taught to lead, the way we were taught to think of relationships with others um, just comes through in buckets right now. You just don't use the the military jargon and terminology. Um, But anyhow, if we fill in the gaps between that and where I am today, uh, I spent a number of years in corporate America, found myself uh, working as a vice president in Delta Airlines, Um, during Mm 9-11, sitting in a boardroom, watching everything unfold. And for a a period of time after that, um, I actually led a task force for the airlines on uh, what was life going to be? What was business going to be? What did we have to do and how did we have to change? Mm -hmm. Um, That was a very, very rewarding time to be able to look at um, what was going on and be able to just make sure that we were true to our foundations of our values and true to the foundations of what uh, travelers were looking for at the time and how could we change the business model to meet those needs. Um, Went from there, a number of other places, and uh, I guess what got me into coaching was um, thought I had made it when I uh, landed a senior VP position at, uh, at Home Depot. Uh, and that was the most miserable time of my life. And when I finally left uh, that corporate position, um, I found this uh, this calling as a business coach. And, you know, ever since then, I've been doing this for 14 years now. Mm-hmm. And it sure is nice. Uh, you, you know, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, I get a text or a phone call from one of my clients. And, uh, you, you know, it's fun to have the client's son called me up and say, Hey coach, dad hit his goal and he's taking us to Disneyland, nice. you know, as opposed to eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, someone called me up and saying, Hey, get your team ready, put together a presentation. We got to meet the board of directors at eight o'clock in the morning, sure. you know, it's something that they weren't even interested in to begin with. So, you know, that's the type of thing where I know uh, what I'm doing, you know, definitely changes people's lives. That's awesome. What did, what did the transition, so yeah, what did the transition look like between your time spent in the military and your time spent in corporate America? Yeah, that, uh, thank you. That's a, that's a super question. Um, You know, one of the challenges that I had then and one of the challenges that I continue to have today is in the military, we have a distinct um, advantage of everyone wears a uniform, Mm -hmm. a uniform tells the history right there and then the rank and the name are on the uniform you know who's in charge and you know where everybody else plays out you know you leave that 
And uh, all of a sudden, you know, you're in business world and you have no clue who's who, what's what, who's in charge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that was the first lesson. The second lesson was, um, you know, in the military, people sign up. It's a volunteer service. They all mm -hmm. sign up and they volunteer. But once they're in, they're in. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a certain level of commitment um, at all levels. And, and that is a different way of being able to be a leader and a manager than it is in today's world where, you know, you've got ghosting going on, you've got people, uh, you know, not showing up. Um, mm -hmm. And then people just basically saying, no, I'm not going to do it. It's a, it's a completely different way of having to take those leadership tenants and apply them mm -hmm. um, and yet same pieces of leadership, communication, trust, respect, they're all there. Um, just have to train and use them differently. Mm -hmm. Do you think, do you think there's a lack of accountability in the private sector in some ways? I don't know that there's a lack of accountability. I think that there is a, um, a vast difference of, uh, of opinions and experiences. Sure. That, yeah. uh, you, you know, people carry with them an unconscious bias and, mm -hmm. a, uh, and, and an unconscious competence. And both of those play into, you know, you, you look at the sky and you call it blue. I look at the sky and I call it blue. We think we're in agreement, but our definitions of blue can be very, very different. Mm -hmm. And it, a lot of times where uh, a, a good leader knows the kind of triage type of questions to ask, mm -hmm. make sure that we're, we're coming from the same point of view. It, it, that's a, yeah. an extra effort that... Uh, you know, executives, leaders, managers, and owners all need to be aware that sometimes what they're saying is is not received in the way or the manner in which they wanted it to be. It's an interesting, it's an interesting point about, you know, looking at the same thing with different perspectives. I had a um, an experience with that just earlier this week, um, where me me and my team are working as an embedded team for one of our clients. And there's another uh, marketer that we work with who's also working for that same client. And we're essentially talking about the exact same things using vastly different nomenclature. Just the, the words that we were using to describe something, the same thing was very, very different. Um, and that caused you know, a, a brief moment of people running around trying to put out fires that weren't really there. <laughs> It, you know, I, I learned a long time ago in the Army, I was a, a duty officer one evening, um, officer that's in charge when everybody else is home and in bed and asleep. And we got a phone call in that uh, uh, the commanding general wanted to speak to the duty officer about the, uh, the movie theater. Mm hmm. Well, I had three or four sergeants finding, you know, capacity, air conditioning, last uh, 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 maintenance repair on this, what was showing and all of this type of stuff. So I was prepared. All he wanted to do was know what was the what was the movie that night? You, you know, <laughs> completely different points of view. It's, uh -huh. uh, yeah, it, it's kind of interesting that if you don't take the extra time and particularly like today, we're Zooming. OK, I see your back. Background, you see my background, it tells a story. So it helps us to get a little more connected, but we're still missing, you know, we, we are missing the walking into the meeting together and the conversation that we have in the hallway. Yep. And then when it's over, walking out and having the after action review at the end of the Zoom. You know, those are vital pieces of, uh, of, of relationship building and communication that uh, managers aren't getting today. And unless we can help them to develop skills and alternatives to that, um, you know, they're, they're less than optimum performance. Yeah, I think, yeah, people don't necessarily place a lot of value on body language or even just a handshake, but you can learn so much about someone by shaking their hand and just witnessing the way that they hold themselves in a room of people. You know, the, the adage in business is people will buy from you when they know you, they like you, and they trust you. Yep. You know, without that 
personal connection, uh, that know, like, and trust, you've got to learn different ways of building that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So, okay. So what did, what then did the transition look like from corporate America into coaching? <laughs> so I call that, uh, as a entrepreneur and a business coach, I am a, a corporate refugee. You know, in corporate America and in the military, you had people around you that reported and you could have them do things for you. You know, you become a, a business coach and an entrepreneur and, you know, you're it. You just yep. change hats. And uh, so learning all of those different uh, vehicles and avenues. And that's, that's the same with, uh, with most small businesses, even uh, major corporations. I've had companies that are 10, $20 million size companies and the CEO owner um, still wants to sign every check that goes out. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you've got, uh, you, you got different levels of, of control and different levels of uh, accountability. Mm -hmm. and there's no one right answer. You know, what's right for one person isn't right for the other. Um, some people have superpowers and that's what I coach to is to try and help them find and identify what their superpower is and use that to apply to the business solution. Yeah. So let's, let's chat more about that. Cause I was, uh, my next question was going to be, how then do you find, you know, this balance of accountability and control? I know for me, you know, I, I run a, a very small company. Um, but giving up control and learning to delegate. Um, and it's, 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 it's a practice, right? I mean, for me, at least it is. Maybe it's not for everyone. Um, but for me, it's certainly a practice is, is being aware of what is in front of me at any given moment and, and wondering to myself, is this something that I need to be doing or is this something that I can or should, uh, should delegate? So how do you, you find that balance? What's your, what's your process kind of look like there? Well, so let me just paint a, a picture for you. And there's two parts to my answer here. The first one is you, I, and anybody that's listening to this, um, we can step into the driver's seat of a car, push a button, turn a key, and instantaneously the dashboard comes alive and we're in control of that car. Mm -hmm. Do I know how to use, do I know how the gas gauge works or the speedometer works? No. But I know that that information is being fed to me. So I know when I look in the rear view mirror, I know whether those blue lights are for me or not. Mm -hmm. You know, when I get in the car and I'm traveling home, I look at the gas gauge and I can be in control and decide, do I need to stop to get gas or can I make it home? Mm -hmm. You know, we can do that with that dashboard. You know, one of the things that uh, that small businesses, executives in, in larger corporations, you know, working with a dashboard of important information that's being fed to you enables you to be in control. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it yourself. You know, that, that's the first part. The second part is when you're asking, how do I interact with others on giving up that control or what's the next step that you do. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a, a process called a, applied learning and it's kind of a triage that I do with my uh, clients. Eh, not necessarily every session, but on a regular basis. And if you were to draw a regular triangle and you label one of the corners knowledge, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's one of the first things I know is if you are supposed to do an action or, or make something happen. Do you know how to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, I can sit in a cockpit of an airplane, but I don't know how to make it take off. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the first thing is the knowledge. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then the next corner is the attitude. If I know what I'm doing, you know, what's my attitude for it? And that mm -hmm. goes back to, you know, high school football, halftime, uh, uh, locker room chat from the coach when the coach comes in, throws a folding chair across the thing and says, y'all are playing like a bunch of sissies. I'm going to put the cheerleaders out there because they can score more points than you can. <laughs> you, you know, that's getting the attitude back in the game. Okay. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you've got to adjust an attitude and, and figure out what's driving that. All the knowledge in the world 
You know, there's a whole lot of people that can sit there and go, yeah, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's made up. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last corner of that is, is the, the action. You know, you know what you're supposed to do. You have a good attitude. Did you get it done or did you let excuses get in the way? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the accountability side. So, you know, as a coach, I'm constantly sliding around that triangle to apply what my clients need next. You know, yeah. sometimes it is accountability. Some of my clients, it's, it's the biggest thing that they have. Other times it's the, uh, it's the learning process. And other times it's a, it's a collection of all three is, is when you get in the center of that triangle and you got all of those, yes, 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 on all four corners or all three corners, um, you're in the zone. Mm -hmm. you know, your client is in the zone. Now we can, we can push the ball forward and achieve what they want to achieve. So if someone has the knowledge to do something, but the attitude is bad, is that something you would then, you know, you, you would recommend uh, delegating that? Or is that something where you work on the attitude? I guess maybe it depends on the, the subject or the task. Uh, it, it depends on the individual. You, sure. you know, I talk about superpowers, okay? Good old Superman. His superpower uh -huh. is he can fly. So if you got to go from point A to point B, you know, he doesn't run. He doesn't swim. That's Aquaman, okay? He mm -hmm. takes off and he flies. But at the same time, kryptonite is his weakness, uh -huh. okay? He gets into a room with kryptonite, and all of a sudden, he can't even walk out of it. You got to have the normal human beings, Jimmy Olsen or Lois Lane, help him away from the kryptonite. Mm -hmm. So when attitude comes in, there's usually a series of questions that you've got to go through to mm -hmm. find out what is it? What's the base root of that attitude? You know, mm -hmm. one of my first clients, uh, we started in, in month over month over month. His uh, bottom line was up, it was down, it was up, it was down, it was up, it was down. And we finally just stopped and said, hey, what's going on? And we dug into it and it's like he would do great. And then he would go to his church on a Sunday and get preach to about, you know, rich people are sinners, <laughs> you know, and that was his identity. And so he would self-sabotage. I don't want to be a sinner. Yeah. You know? So we had to switch and talk through that and understand. So there's a little bit of learning, a little bit of attitude to be able to shift a mindset there that no, you know, that's, that's not what he was saying at all. The love of money can be bad. But the opposite of that is when you own your own business, the more margin you make, the more mission you can achieve. Mm -hmm. You're not making money and you can't go out and be a philanthropist or, you know, do mission work all over the world. If you're making lots of money, you can make lots of good from that money. For sure. Yeah, I like that. I like that. The other... Um with the going to church and, you know, saying that rich people are sinners. The other thing that just randomly comes to my mind is something about, I think it's a Bible quote, something about a rich man has about as much likelihood of getting into heaven as a camel through the eye of a needle. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Yes, it does. I think that's another one that we got to kind of teach, teach people. It's, it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be that way. Well, you know, that there, therein lies, it's a great segue to today and today's uh, business environment is um, people hear pieces, uh -huh. hear a, a Bible verse. Out of context. Out of context. Sure. You know, without studying and, and I, you know, Michael, I don't know that, that you realize, yeah, I graduated from West Point and uh, I think it was in 2010. I went back to school and got a theological degree. Okay. Not to preach or anything, but to to feel personally that I was grounded in what I was doing and, you know, churches on Sunday, but business is the rest of the week. Yep. You know, how do I act congruently mm -hmm. with what I'm trying to believe? So, you know, that is where, you know, helping people understand, like you said, the context, who was writing that, what was it being said? What were the events of that time? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then how does that equate to today's world? Mm -hmm. And then when we talk through that, what does it mean to you? Yeah. It may be something completely different to you than it does to me. You know, I don't have to be wrong for you to be right. 
Mm-hmm. And the last thing is, okay, after we've discussed all of that, what do you want to do about that? What decisions can you make going forward? Yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, today's today specifically, like thinking about it in that sense, like it's such a a meme world, you know, five second short TikTok videos. A lot of things I think are taken out of context um, these days, and 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 context is so important to understanding things at a deep level. You know, you're absolutely right, and uh, it, it was decades ago. Um, I, I was turned on to um, the mindset list. Beloit mm-hmm. University in Beloit, uh, Illinois, created mm-hmm. this mindset list, and it is uh, geared towards just helping us older boomers understand the differences in experiences. And you know, just this year's mindset list is, hey, congratulations, it's 2021, the entering class this fall for college, the class of 2025, okay? They were not alive on 9-11. To them, the Twin Towers never existed. Wow. Uh Uh-huh. See, this is where you kind of have to match up with what is the reality of of other people. Yeah. I had the benefit. I I was a child and lived when man walked on the moon. Yeah. Younger people, uh, you know, we've put rovers on different things, but they've never been around. The people have never been around when the Berlin Wall was up. Yeah. When when we lived and and did, uh, you know, air raid drills in school because of big bad Russia and Soviet Union, you know, so I have a, a, a whole collection of experiences uh-huh. that aren't necessarily my customers uh-huh. and aren't necessarily, you know, what they're expecting when they're doing work with you. And to understand that different perspective enables us to give them what they need and give them what they want. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And I think, and it's, you know, it, could be it could be difficult for young people as well right because the more it's my opinion that you can learn a lot from history how not to repeat certain mistakes specifically (laughs) um but obviously the more time that passes the more history exists and the more you have to learn all of the history right so i mean it's at some point you've got to just pick the most important things and, and and other stuff gets lost in history because you just can't learn everything you just can't there's not yeah that's correct you know it's ever it's expanding exponentially you know technology is increasing exponentially knowledge in the the not necessarily knowledge but the accessibility to knowledge it's Mm -hmm. right there on my phone Mm -hmm. when i was in college i had to go to the library and pull out books and read chapters and try and find stuff you know now i just exactly it's in your pocket well, you know, Alexa, yeah. tell me my answer. Yeah. Um, and, and the challenge there, though, is are we using the right thought mm-hmm. to get what we want? So many times we're missing. You know, I, I talked about the triangle. Another shape that I use is a donut. And many of my clients, you know, we got to go through an unraveling at the beginning of a coaching session of, you know, this happened. They saw that on the news. Oh, gasoline prices are going to do this and that's going to happen. Do I or don't I wear my mask today? You know, yeah, blah, 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 blah. You know, I look at the donut shape and the donut hole is my control. And the donut self is my concern. You know, I can be concerned that it's going to rain today. Oh, my goodness, I was going to wear this and now I'm going to get wet. Just wash the car, blah, 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 blah. You know, that's concern and I can waste a lot of energy there. Mm -hmm. I'll focus on just what I can control. Well, Mm -hmm. it's going to rain today. Super. Let me take an umbrella and you know what? I can wash the car again. Sure. If I focus on that, look at all the rest of the energy that just dissipates. I don't have to invest it. So it's just that that bullseye donut of where are you focusing? And mm-hmm. many times that's that's the attitude and the accountability in the coaching that I do with my clients is is helping them to recognize and eh, that's that's the wrong target to aim for. Let's go back to what's important to you. Yeah, I love that. 
That's good. So let's talk about your clients. Who who are your clients? Who do you typically who do you typically work with? Um. Wow. I don't know how to to typically. <laughs> um. I, I mean, listen. I I have. I have clients, everything from a florist shop and an air conditioning repair company to uh, a vascular surgeon, uh, several different sizes of veterinarians and dentists, um, you know, machine shops, you, you, you name it. I've, I've got, uh, I think my youngest client is a 27 year old and my oldest client is probably in his seventies. Mm -hmm. um, so it goes across the entire board. Um, and how do you, how do they find you? Um, it, it, you know, a, a lot of times, no, if, if there's any other coaches listening to this podcast, you know, we all know the exact same fact of life. No one ever wakes up, hits the alarm in the morning and says, wow, I really need a business coach today. <laughs> That's it work. Okay. In vast, the, the, the vast majority of people um, you know, either don't know what a coach does or um, are, are instantaneously against it. You know, they grew up and they had a coach for Little League or they may have had a coach for or a, a tutor for uh, piano or dance or anything like that for something that they're going to enjoy the rest of their life. But mm -hmm. once we all become adults, I don't need a coach to tell me what's going on. Mm -hmm. and, you know, somehow... In sports, we can see that connection. You know, there isn't a championship team anywhere in the world that doesn't have a coach or a whole collection of coaches. You know, there isn't a single Olympian that's going to be in Japan this summer that doesn't have a coach that got them there. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you look at business, there's a very small group of people that can make that, that assimilated connection between I'm running a business. It's just like a sports team. If I want to be successful and win the championship, whatever that goal may be, then why don't I have a, a mentor, uh, a, a coach? You know, mm -hmm. it's all, all, all of us. If we wanted to get into better shape, there's people that get into better shape and there's some that can do that by push-ups, sit-ups and running outside. They don't need mm -hmm. anything else. That's a goal. I've had um, executives, I've had corporations um, hire me to say, look, this, this VP over here is slated to get to the C-suite. You know, mm -hmm. we, need to, we need you to help him make that improvement in the level of, of leadership. I've also had executives call me up directly and, uh, and engage me and said, you know, Rick, see this bonus that I'm going to get at the end of the year? You're going to help me get it because yeah. this is what it means to my family, you know, uh, and, and then I've got others like, uh, uh, you know, small HVAC air conditioning repair company, you know, uh, husband and wife run it together. Uh, wife is a high school graduate and she does all of the books and all of the financials and mm -hmm. it, you know, stressed to the max because she doesn't know what she's doing. Mm -hmm. you know, helping and giving them the base fundamentals. That's the fun part is going into them and they're going, you know, Rick, we got a budget now. And you know what? For the first three months of this year, we're ahead of budget. I said, well, <laughs> when's the last time you could say that? I said, never. How's that make you feel? Oh, man, we're not even fighting anymore. In fact, we went out and had a date night the other night. Like, man, <laughs> this is the great part of, of what I do. <laughs> <laughs> marriage counselor on top of it, huh? <laughs> I, I really don't want to go there. You know, but when it's a family, yeah, you're a marriage counselor, you're a family counselor. Oh, goodness. I can't tell you the number of times that I've coached a, a family run business, multi generational, where, you know, they get together for Thanksgiving, they get together on weekends for barbecues in the backyard. But if mm -hmm. I ask one generation what the other one's goals are in life, they, they start off with, I think, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you know, just getting, getting that alignment, you know, usually <laughs> restores peace in the world because they're starting to talk. And, and most of them is they just don't know what they don't know about how to do that. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, Tiger Woods, when he was in the prime of his uh, of his game, you know, there was a, a section of a, 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 a season where he was just having a horrible time with his short game. 
And so he went to his, his caddy and said, you know, look, you got to help me out here, man. I need to improve my short game. Well, the caddy went to the driving range and got, you know, like 10 buckets of balls and said, hit it. Tiger Woods did. And then he turned around and said, look, I said I needed to improve my short game, not my, my drive off the tee. Mm-hmm. And the caddy said, the coach said, your superpower is your drive. You can hit it 10, 20 yards farther than anybody else. If we can get you to hit another 10 yards beyond that, you got no short game. Mm-hmm. And you like hitting off the tee. You just did it with 10 buckets of balls. See, that's what a coach does is I understand my clients probably sometimes a little better than they do after a while of, of working with them and helping them apply their strengths to a problem instead of always fixing the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, problem. That's a consultant. They come in, write a big old report on it and give it to you and say, here's how to fix that problem. Uh-huh. You know? I like that. That's, that's uh, it's classic Peter Drucker. I think uh, he's, he's the one in uh, effective executive. One of the, mm-hmm. one of the parts in there was uh, focus on your strengths. Don't, yeah. uh, don't, don't spend a whole bunch of time on your weaknesses. If you're really good at something, focus on that and you'll get a lot further. You know, and it's so easy because we wake up in the morning and whatever that superpower is, we don't think about it. We don't have to study or prepare for it. We're going, I got this. Yeah. Well, if I can take that and apply it to something else, then, you know, and that helps you get to your goal. Mission accomplished. Mm-hmm. And you're happy. <laughs> how do you uh, how do you establish or how do you help someone find out what their strengths are? If someone doesn't know, if a client doesn't know what their strengths are, right? Like they just don't know. You know, there's there's so many good tools out there today. You've got a, a, a whole collection of assessment tools. Mm-hmm. You know, screen finders is one, uh, disc profile. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, there's, there's just a million of them. There was even one I found, uh, oh, a year or so ago on how do I view money, you mm-hmm. know? assessment of everybody has a different view of what money means to them and that can be a strength or that can be a weakness but you know understanding how they view money and using that becomes a strength so there's assessments that are available all over um you know someone needs to know what they are or what my favorite ones are they can get a hold of me just reach out to me on linkedin and you know i'd be more than happy to talk with you um, you know, beyond that, uh, it, it's a, it's really very similar to um, a, a coach in preseason football. Mm-hmm. You know, they're putting everybody through certain drills and they're watching how they react and how they respond. Yeah. You know, that questions and, and alignment processes where I dig deep into a business, big or small and um you know evaluate their financials evaluate their people get uh feedback uh on performances and whatnot and and pull that all together to start to it's it's like knitting a quilt mm-hmm. you know, get little pieces together but it's not until you know the the artistry of that quilt is finally displayed that you can see the big picture Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of a, avoiding that answer because there really isn't any, you must do step A, B, and C, and here's your strength. And that sure. just doesn't look that way. Yeah. You know, it, it, I, I will have to say that where I usually start is in someone's values. Okay. I like it, that. I like that answer a lot. You know, if it, we there's different ways of finding values or or equating what they could be, but you know, I, I strongly believe, and I read it a, a long time ago. You know, if you come into work every single day, if you come into your business every day, and your values are being met, mm-hmm. you well, know, your energy is 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 fed. Mm-hmm. Okay, it it, it multiplies. Mm-hmm. But if you go into any type of environment. And those values aren't being met. Mm-hmm. It, it's like a leech just sucking the life out of you. You, you know, you go into the office and there's uh, if trust is a value and there's somebody there that you just can't trust at all. You know, every single day you're sitting there twitching, waiting and saying, oh, is this person going to show up or not show up? Um, so, it, you know, I would say definitely got to start with values. Yeah, I like that. That's great. Um, cool. Let's, let's move on a little bit. I'm, I'm curious to know what sorts of things, um, 
when you first when you first started as a coach, what sorts of things did you struggle with as a new coach? <laughs> oh man, as a new coach, the things I struggled with was uh, um, what was the interpersonal and the the right brain side. Okay, I, I, I suffer from being a, an engineer by education and by profession. Mm -hmm. Right. I'd go into a situation, A plus B equals C. Don't you see that? Is C is the right answer here. What's wrong with you? You know, and it wasn't the the, the right brain or the context or, or you, you know, the rest of the flavor, style, and spin of the entire environment. I, I completely missed out on. The human um, equation. The human equation, it took a lot. I think it probably took my personal coach at the time about eight months to finally get me to break through and see that, you know, going in and working with somebody that I first met, you mm -hmm. know, having the, the A plus B equals C formula just wasn't yielding the results. Mm -hmm. right? But when I got to the emotional side of, you know, can you tell me how your your son Timmy is going to feel when you tell him you're taking him to Disneyland. Yeah. It's like, whoa, as soon as I saw that and the power of that, it's like, who cares what A plus B equals C is, you know? I actually got a point where it was kind of fun. I had a a box of Kleenex on my uh on my desk and I I knew every time I could get someone to to cry, to break down into tears, we had a breakthrough and they achieved their goals. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it was that was a getting in touch with the, you know, soldiers don't cry, leaders don't cry. This is combat. Uh -huh. You know, put a band aid on it and keep driving. Uh -huh. you know, Rub it with dirt, walk it off. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You, you know, and, and it, it took my coach to to point out to me, you know, what was the last car that you got that you purchased for yourself? And I said, well, a red Mustang convertible. And he said, did you get that because it was, it had a great trunk space or you got that because the entire family could get in? I said, no. Well, why <laughs> did you get it? Cause it looked hot and I felt good driving fast. <laughs> you know, it was, it was the emotion side, you know, then you try and justify it with all the facts. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's classic marketing for sure. You you purchase with your heart and justify with your head. You justify the purchase. The de the decision is made down here in your heart, and then the justification after the decision is made with your head when you're looking at yeah the, the facts. You know, the, the fun part about that is when we realize that we do that every single day from when the alarm goes off and we first look in the mirror to mm. when we hit that bed again is we are marketing to ourselves. What's the story that we're telling ourselves? Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. So what kind of, uh, to kind of continue riffing on that a little bit, what kind of things do you struggle with as a coach today? Um, wow, struggle with as a coach today. Um, Surely every day is not just a cakewalk for you. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the cake is usually a, a dark chocolate and kind of stinky. <laughs> that's that's the type of walk. No, um, you, you know, it, the biggest thing that I have um, currently is, is simply pivoting the marketing and getting in touch with the people. You know, mm -hmm. once, I'm with, once I'm with them, once we've committed to work together, I got all the confidence in the world that we're going to get the results. And I've got a, a, a huge um, playlist of client testimonials th that we can do that. Mm -hmm. It's getting to that next person. And, mm -hmm. you know, we went remote like this. This is great. I get to talk to you and you're on the other coast from me. Mm -hmm. um, the, this, the bad part about that is, um, you know, all of the, the networking, all of the personal introductions, um, just aren't there. And so pivoting to a virtual world has its benefits, but it also has its uh, its drawbacks on getting to that next person. Like I said, no one ever wakes up in the morning, says, I need a business coach. Let me Google it and find somebody. It just yeah. doesn't work that way. So, you know, it's it's getting to the people that are those people's trusted advisors. And, you know, when there's a 
grew up in the South. You get a recommendation or an introduction from someone uh, that's that's known in the community, you're in. They say, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it doesn't matter what the rest of it is if you're an, perceived as an outsider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I almost wonder with, you know, the the 2020, the COVID effect, we'll call it, um, just everything being on Zoom now, if you're not sacrificing connection for the sake of reach, Oh, it, you know, there, there was, I've read a number of articles on that. It's one of the things that enabled us to do this is we had relationships before it happened. So we had those in-person relationships and we can draw those in. It's mm -hmm. much more difficult to create a new, you know, no like and trust off of a two-dimensional screen that we've talked to for, you know, 45 minutes. And then Zoom says, you have two more minutes and then I got to cut you off. Oh, bye. You know, yeah. there's 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 a whole different challenge there. You know, yeah. there's a whole different challenge for business owners and executives as well. You know, I don't know about you, but just a, a quick story is, you know, when's the last time that you went out to eat and you sat down in a restaurant to eat? Mm -hmm. You know, what what today, this week, you know, what were your expectations of going out and sitting down? Mm hmm. And see, they're different. Okay, we're we're now looking at going to a restaurant and sitting down, uh, whether we consciously think of it or that you know right brain context of it is, you know, I'm putting myself at risk coming out to your restaurant. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting some sort of experience that is above Uber Eats or carry out. Yeah, you know, again, if we look at how has this changed life for people and help them to understand, um, you know, what are those little, I mean, simple thing of when I go to my first networking event, do I shake a hand? Do I fist bump? Do I elbow bump? Do I nod to them? It, you know, people are going to have to come back out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's no wrong answer. It's what's right for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's in chaos, there's a huge uh, opportunity. You know, when I coach my clients, I'm saying, you know, what are your values? What are your strengths? Um, and how can we apply those in this changing environment? So it's not planning, it's, it's preparing mm -hmm. and it's being able to be flexible. Some of, one of my clients uh, owned a, uh, a large pool service company. Mm -hmm. and had uh, we went through this exercise and like the very next day he had an opportunity to buy two franchise restaurants where the owner just wanted to get out you know they did their due diligence and they looked through and it was a it was a gold mine it was a you know I can't believe this dropped in my lap mm -hmm. and so now he's a restaurateur as in addition to being a pool guy you know, I've had uh, a, a, an attorney that, uh, you know, the same thing happened there is, you know, we looked at this and when everybody got locked down, everybody, you know, the, the attorney needs and the mm -hmm. ability to go into a courthouse dried up. Sure. Um, he pivoted. He bought a liquor store. <laughs> I kid, you know, but that's, it, an, that's an investment. A liquor store purchased last spring. Ooh, you've done well. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's like, that's like a tree. When's the best time to buy a liquor store is 30 years ago. When was the best time to do it when this thing started? Uh -huh. yeah, again, enabling my clients to see that the base fundamentals of business that they apply in one business can apply in something else. We just need to understand what are your values? What are your strengths? And how do those play in this business opportunity? Mm -hmm. And does that or doesn't it make sense for you to try it? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Good kind stuff. of fun. So fun you, Give me those phone calls. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So you've told us about a couple of your client wins. Tell us about some other ones. What are, what are some like some really big uh, wins that your clients have had that, that you've kind of, you know, helped them to get there, help them to reach those goals? You know, I, I guess the, the biggest win that I can report is a, a longtime uh, client of mine. It's, it's on my LinkedIn page. Um, you know, Dr. Dan was, mm -hmm. a, was a surgeon. Uh, I got introduced to him. And the, I can remember the very first meeting. He says, Rick, I'm a surgeon. Mm -hmm. This is my livelihood. 
and I just had a heart attack. You know, there's only so many more years where I can use my fingers to make a living. I need to learn how to take this medical practice that I have and turn it into something that will provide for me and my family. Mm -hmm. We took him and grew his practice from two doctors to uh, eight providers. And we grew their um, couple million dollars to uh, well over $16 million um, at the end. And then we sold it. Nice. You know, so we gave him That's everything great. that he needed. This, this guy was fabulous. I mean, I used to have to, on the back of his office door, he had a, a, a surgical jacket. Uh-huh. And I made him put a sport coat back there because sometimes he would get into doctor mode. And I go, uh-huh, uh-huh, we got to get you in CEO mode. Put the sport coat on. Uh-huh. You know, I'm talking to CEO Dan, not Dr. Dan. Yeah. Um, but that that was very, very rewarding to be able to take something full life cycle. Like that. That's great. Yeah, that's great. I love I love the. Uh, I'm just going to call it a trick, the clothes swapping trick. Uh, my coach has me do that as well for, for when I'm, you know, as an entrepreneur, we all wear different hats and uh, just swapping out a shirt or a jacket. Um, you know, it, it makes a difference. It, it's just a turns a little key inside your head. I think works for me. It does. You know, one of the, Doctor. one of the tricks that my coach did for me long, long ago, cause I was coaching by Skype at one point. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the, she said two things. Number one is if you feel yourself energy dripping, stand up, it always improves everything. Mm-hmm. She said number two is before you start a coaching session, take off your shoes, put them to the side mm-hmm. and have another set of shoes that you put on that mm-hmm. reminds you that you're not coaching from your perspective. You're coaching from their perspective. Mm-hmm. And it's like, wow. That was, you know, just doing that physical activity to make sure that, you know, it's, you get in a conversation and listening to what someone is saying instead of preparing what you want to say next and waiting for them to breathe. Yeah. Just a, a, again, moving into that right brain and being present at the time to be yeah. able to give people what they need. It's a nice little yeah. attitude trigger or adjustment trigger, I guess, something like that. Little, little tricks of the trade. That's great. Yeah. Um, what about fail- big failures or big, uh, if you want to call them learning points in your, in your coaching career? Anything notable there that you want to share with us? Um, you know, I, I, I won't, I, I can't say that I have a failure that, you know, directly impacted a client. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that to me personally, my biggest failure is um, uh, in recognizing um, false profits and trust issues. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I uh, went to West Point. It's back there on the, on the wall. You know, yeah. we had the honor code. will not lie, cheat, or steal, nor tolerate those that do. And that's just a given for me. If somebody says something, I take it as their bond. Yeah. That, that is, they are going to do it. And, yet, and there's not a whole lot of people that have that same level. You know, yeah. words are used differently by people. There's no right, there's no wrong. But my interpretation, and that's my failure, is when someone says things and I first meet them, I'm taking them at their word because that's my background. When many times people are saying something, you know, simply to hear themselves process it uh-huh. and you know, they don't really have any commitment or ownership to it at all. They're just wanting to hear the idea. Interesting. And being able to, to identify that is still, that's, that's my personal kryptonite. Um, you know, as a result of that, I, uh, what was it? Four, four or five years ago, um, I, I created a personal board of directors. I've mm-hmm. got four very, very close friends that I said, you know, my commitment to you is I don't make a big decision before I talk to you. Your commitment to me is when I call you, you give me you know, your fair, unbiased opinion. Mm-hmm. And I don't take action until I've heard from at least two of you. Mm-hmm. It's served me well. Nice. Yeah. Do you, do you think that there's a loss in modern times of, you call it chivalry, call it a code, 
you know, uh, people, you know, keeping their word, so to speak? Um, I think it has different meaning today. Uh huh. It certainly has different meaning to different people, but just Not in general, you know, having, having a code, if someone, like you were saying, like if someone says something, you take them at their word, there was a time I feel like, you know, I'm, 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 not hundreds of years old, so I don't know, but I feel like there was a time at one point in history um, where, you know, people had a code. There was a code that you lived by. You know, the cowboy wouldn't shoot another cowboy in the back, even in the Wild West. Um, you got to be facing the guy. Um, stuff like that. Uh, you know, obviously, <laughs> that's a gross exaggeration of the topic we're discussing, you know, business. But um, what, what do you what do you think about that? Do you have any thoughts on that at all or? You know, um, I have the privilege of getting together, gathering together once a month with uh, with other West Point graduates in the local area. Mm -hmm. you know, we get together for a breakfast, we get together for a lunch, and we get together to watch football games. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my, uh, my girlfriend is new to this, never knew me when I was in the military, doesn't even know what West Point is, hasn't been there, but through me. Mm -hmm. And her comment was, we've got, you know, graduates of all different. We got a uh, graduate from a class of 54 all the way up to a graduate of class of 2013. And, you know, after getting together and drinking beers and swapping stories and whatnot, you know, we come home and she tells me, now I get it. Y'all are just alike. I went, yeah. <laughs> said it doesn't matter what year, but because of that commonality, mm -hmm. you know, we can step into any situation and I know they got my back and I got theirs. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a privilege that we have. And uh, I, I feel for those that don't have that, but in society, you know, if I don't know that, that they're a grad, I'm slow to hand that trust out. Yeah. as freely as I am to somebody that I know. So, you know, that was a, there are things that we talk about that every single class talks about. So yes, there was a code that we have. You know, sadly what's happened is in today's America, only 7% of the entire population is a veteran to begin with. Mm -hmm. And West Point is only a small fraction of that. Sure. So, you know, that we have to live with everybody else and help figure out how we communicate and how we get that code. And, and we're not by, by no means is that the only code. There are lots of other organizations, societies, beliefs, churches, everything that do have codes. Um, you know, but are there some common chivalry? You know, that kind of went out with... Uh, uh, <laughs> well, that went out when civics went out of class. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, the code, the code of the South. I'm gonna hold a door for a lady. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I can't tell you the number of times in the last couple of years where I've not met with a positive response because I was holding a, a door for a lady. Sure. Who took that as a offensive gesture? Mm -hmm. Sorry, still going to do it. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> you, you, you know, it's, uh, that that's my code, not yours. If you don't like it, then you can tell me to let the door go and you can open it up yourself. But, sure. you know, that, it's a we, we kind of get off on that. But yeah, no, I, it, I, I, you know, I, I get it. Down through time. You know, like I said, the, the people entering college this fall um, were not around when the Twin Towers were up. Yeah. Completely different environment. Yeah. No. Yeah. And the, that awareness that you have of that and now that I have of that and everyone listening to this podcast, I think, um, you know, if only just just being aware of, of that, that's a thing now. Um, I mean, it's yeah, that caught me off guard <laughs> when you first mentioned it. it, it's like, wow, yeah, that's true. Trust me, you know, it caught me off guard. I mean, there, there's uh, what was it? I love 1990s. I was in corporate America. Uh -huh. Okay. I use this every single day. Uh -huh. We didn't have these. Yeah. Okay. You didn't and, even have Blackberry back then, I don't think. Pagers. Pagers. Yeah. 
were the high technology, you know, uh, 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 um, a, a digital assistant where I could keep names and phone numbers in it, but no internet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so there, there's a whole lot of advantages there. Um, but there's a whole lot of truth to the difference between being called a millennial and a, and a boomer. Yeah. You know, I think probably even being a boomer, but I think I'm probably one of the more progressive ones that I get where I came from and I get that, you know, there's a whole lot more that I can learn. Yeah, I did have a Blackberry at one point and now I do have a smartphone. <laughs> uh-huh. so, I don't know how we got on that, Michael. From, uh, I don't know. You know it, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Um, Rick, I want to be respectful of your time. We're coming up on sure. the hour mark here, it looks like. So I want to thank you for joining us. You do have uh, something about a market assessment and business preparation session to share with yeah. Uh, the listeners? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, um, you know, listen, if, if anything I said today is of value to anybody and you stuck along this far, um, go to my LinkedIn page, get connected with me and specifically ask for a a free business strategy session. You know, whether you're a coach or whether you're a a business owner or you're an executive, I'll I'll schedule something with you. We'll do a little background uh, preparation so I can get laser focused on what's important to you right now. But in that, what do we do? I, I take you through a concept of what are your values? What are some of your superpowers? and what's happening in the world around you today and end up with what do you think you should do about it? Mm-hmm. You know, simple as that. Simple as that. Awesome. Uh, and Rick, where can our listeners connect with you online? Um, it, you know, online, um, you know, obviously I've got uh, Action Coach is my company. Uh, so you can go to Action Coach slash my name rick plaskett you'll get to my um my web page uh, again i i'm a boomer that's been educated okay no one goes to a web page anymore look me up on linkedin and get connected there that's the that's the best way i'm looking at that on a regular basis and i i connect with all the people there so go to linkedin look for rick plaskett that's just like basket only starts with a p and an l um and and yeah that's probably the best way to get in touch with me fantastic rick i want to thank you so much for spending time with me here i really appreciate it hey michael thank you so much it's been fun you're 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 a joy to work with and talk to (laughs) i appreciate that thank you uh thanks to everyone uh, watching and listening um we'll see you next time